I would like to talk about what really matters other than Christmas trees, other than lights, and I know that the air is just riddled with anticipation for what we're talking about this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. That's where we're going to be primarily uh, this morning. But before we really go into John, I want to touch base with the scripture that we had read for us by Sister Cecilia as we lit the Christ and candle of love. And I want to just touch base on Isaiah chapter 9, two verses, 6 and 7, really quickly. Because something miraculous happens in Isaiah 6 and 7 of chapter 9. And here's what it is. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, those two verses of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, are very, very important because they establish who Christ is. This was thousands of years. A prophecy. Between the Old Testament of the prophets to the New Testament of Christ, we have hundreds of years gaping between them. Hundreds of years have passed, and we've had the promises of a Christ. But in the time that Jesus enters into the world, there had been a hundred year gap. Hundreds of years in between. And I want to touch base on this because this proves in who Christ is. This is what we call a prophecy. When something that God says is going to happen takes place. It doesn't matter our time length. It doesn't fit into what we think it should happen, when we say it should happen, but in when He promises it will. And notice that God doesn't go the extra mile to give us star dates on these things. Many people today are wondering when Christ's return will be. And we just simply don't know because that isn't for us to know. We would be too distracted with that knowledge. That's why he gives it to us in the form of prophecy, in the form of it will happen. Because when we understand the prophecy of Christ, when we understand that it was completed, it gives us faith and gives us hope that the second coming as a prophecy will happen. God has never unfulfilled a prophecy. We are currently up to date in our prophecies. Why? Because we have a God that keeps promises. But today we need to focus on the idea of prophecy in one grand concept. We are the children of the awaited one. Now this needs to be dealt with with the utmost sensitivity. Because we live in a world that likes to think, well, we are all the children of God. And unfortunately, the Bible disagrees. Everyone who is born on this earth is not a child of God. That goes purely against Scripture. People who are Christians, people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, they have been given a right to be a child of God. And I, that is why I want us to look at John chapter 1 very closely. So if you have John chapter 1 opened, I want you to look at verse 12 with me. John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, But to all who did receive Him, being Jesus Christ, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, anyone in this world who claims we are all just the children of God, ignore this verse. 
It says very, very clearly, being called a child of God is a God-given right to those who believe in Him, to those who have faith in Him. And in order to say otherwise, does away with Scripture and its authority in the lives of the people that God has created. If we want to be children of the awaited one, the child uh, of the one who came as a mere act of prophecy and out of love, we have to first deal with who is Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7, we get a very clear picture. He is a king. And in verse 6, it says he is a mighty counselor. He is a mighty God, an everlasting father, the prince of peace. He brings all of these things. And to name all of God's titles, well, there would be just no room for anything else if we did that. He has many names. But as in Mary, did you know, as the way it ends so beautifully, so eloquently, he is the great I am. The very first name that we have for God. When God reveals himself to Moses. Up until then he had said he is the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. But to Moses he says, but Lord if I go to the Israelites. Who shall I say you are? He says, I am the great I am. This is important. Who is God? He is who he is. He doesn't need a prefix. He doesn't need us to stand in and say, well, his name is this. He doesn't need it because he's God. It goes beyond what you and I are used to on a fundamental level. He is the God that fulfills prophecy. He is the God that keeps promises. He is the God that makes you and I to have the right to be children of God if we believe in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ. Well, then we have to deal with something very fundamental. Why is it through Jesus Christ? This is a fair question that stumps the great agnostic of the day. Why Jesus Christ? Why can't it be every road leads to heaven? Why can't it be that way? Well, if you look at John chapter 1, go to verse 9. We read about John the Baptist. And let's just read about this real quick. In John chapter 9, we read this. John the Baptist, he says he gives a prophecy about a light. And then in verse 9, it says the true light. The true light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. This is talking purely about Jesus. This isn't talking about, well, Buddha or the prophet Muhammad. This isn't talking about anything else in this world. This is Jesus Christ. The reason it all is through him, the reason he is the true light, is because the world was made through him. Well, how can that be? He's born. He's born of physical flesh here, but this isn't the first time we've seen Jesus. If you go through the book of Genesis, we see A, Isaac wrestling with a man of God. We see Isaac being brought to his wife and an angel responds to the calling of him coming to marry Rebecca. We also see Jacob when he was really, really scared of meeting with Esau, his brother. He separates himself from the people of Israel. He says, every one of you pass upon the Jordan. You guys go across the ocean. You guys go across the sea here. I need to be left alone. And all that night, Jacob is wrestling with the concept of God. But on a more physical level, we have a physical depiction of God. A physical being of God. Well, who is the physical being of God? It's Jesus he was able to manifest himself in flesh before we see him in the New Testament. 
We have it in the Old Testament. And now just that, go back to Abraham again. When Abraham was sitting in the tent, the cool of the day, we have Jesus, a man of God, with two angels by his side, meet Abraham at the tent. And Abraham says, please turn here, Lord. He uses the uppercase L. He's talking Elohim. He's talking about God of the universe there. And in physical form, we have Jesus walking with two angels in the time of Abraham. Well, how can that be possible? Because Jesus is not just man. He took on the costume or the ability to suit up like a man. But his spirit is 100% the spirit of God, the consciousness that created everything. His soul, his spirit that was in the human flesh that we call Jesus is God, Elohim, the great I am. And we see this later when he's talking to his apostles. And he talks to Philip. And Philip says, Lord, if you would just show us the Father, if we could just see the Father. And Jesus affectionately looks at Philip and says, Philip, I've been with you for such a long time and you still don't know me? Unveiling the concept that the God the Father that Philip wanted to see is in fact Jesus. They are one and the same. We have to understand this because that is why there is one path, one true light. Nobody else created the world. Nobody else created the world. Only God so he is the one way that we know this. And we have a promise and prophecy that he's coming again. So if we believe the prophecy that happened in Isaiah, that happened in Jeremiah, that happened through the rest of the prophets, and we believe that it came to pass, that little night in Bethlehem, that we have nothing but hope in the prophecy that we have now, that he is coming again soon. And let me just say, yes, it's been over 2,000 years since Christ uh, died on the cross and resurrected and went off. And we've had the church for those 2,000 years. But so what? There were hundreds of years between the old prophets and the New Testament. God can do whatever he wants. And we see that in the book of Romans. Where the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. Which one of you can tell the potter? What he is to make. is he? Can he not take the same lump and make of one vessel an honorable vessel and a dishonorable vessel? Who are you to challenge the potter? He is the one who creates it all. We have no right to question him. So yes, it's been a while, but it is still soon in the concept of God. He is giving everyone who needs a chance to know him, to know him. And that's what Christmas is truly all about. <clears throat> Not just him being a baby in the manger. Which is how we like to think about him in Christmas time. It is the coming story of him coming to earth. To really touch base with us on a fundamental humanistic level. But we need to understand that that's where it starts. But that isn't the whole story. The whole story is what took place after. Who he is. He is the promised king. <laughs> As a baby, he made Herod shake in his boots to the point where Herod launches a killing spree among all of the children of Judea that are two years old and under to kill out the promised king of the prophecy. But you cannot fight prophecy, not the prophecy of God, the living God. You're fighting a losing battle. So yes, he, was, he created the world. He is the true light. But verse 11 says this, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He had set up in the four beginnings of the world the people of the Jewish nation. His people, the promised people, the heir bringers of God. And he had set them up. He had pulled them together to be an example of holiness, which is just to be set apart from other people. And he came to them. And you would think that if they were truly his children, if they were truly his people, they would know his voice. There is nobody outside of Frisco that talks like Frisco because only people from Frisco or around Frisco know that it's called Frisco. Amen? 
You all know each other. You know if somebody lives in the area based off of, they call it Frisco versus, San, versus Francisco. Oh, you must be an out-of-towner. <laughs> it's the same thing. He came to his people, and because they're his people, they should know the way he talks. They should know the sound of the voice of the Father. They were given the voice of the Father, but they did not know him. They did not receive him. This speaks very loud and clear. This goes beyond people receiving people and not receiving. This is so much deeper than just bad hospitality. Do we understand this this morning? He came to people who were designed to know his voice. And his voice they did not know because they were not intimate with him. They were not intimate with him. But then in verse 12. All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be the children of God. You want to be a child of God, you have to believe in Jesus Christ as the only way. There are some people out there in the world that say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, but there are many other ways to get to heaven. No, there's not. Not if you claim to be a Christian. If you claim to be a Christian and then you then again say, but there's other ways. I just chose Christ. You are not a Christian because you have to believe there is only one way. That is a Christian. Well, John, that's kind of divisive. I'm sorry, but we didn't come here to establish unity with the world. God came to bring a sword. He came to divide a household, a mother against daughter, a son against father, a brother against brother, because guess what? There is one truth. And his name is Jesus. And in his name alone, we have as what for, uh, verse 14 promises. We have a God that became flesh to dwell among us. We have a God that came to give us full grace. And we have a God that came to give us love and truth. In verse 16 it says this. For, for from His fullness we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You cannot have grace, you cannot have truth, if you do not believe in Jesus as the sole proprietor of truth. And we are living in a world full of proof. This Christmas Eve, this Christmas season, we have people that believe and emphasizing Christmas light decorations over who Christmas is for. If you go and you ask people, what is Christmas for? It's about giving gifts. It's about giving love. It's about all of these things. But very rarely do you get a secular person that even acknowledges Jesus Christ because that's religion. The world holds their hand up. They say, we don't want religion. Well, here's what the church has done wrong. Instead of saying, okay, you don't want religion, we'll leave you alone. We should be screaming, we don't want religion either. There is a fundamental difference between faith and religion. And I am so sick and tired of every time I tell somebody my occupation, they say, oh, well, you're religious. No, I'm not. I hate that term very much because I am not religious. I just happen to preach in a general Baptist church to general Baptist people. But we are Christians fundamentally at nature. And the problem is with the atheist, with the agnostic, they look at our different denominations. And they say, well, see, you, you, you guys are talking about there's only one way, but then you have Catholics, you have uh, Episcopalians, you have Methodists, you have Baptists. There's different ways. No, there's not. We, we are all called to preach Jesus Christ. That is the one and only way. But as we can see here, there is confusion in this world. And therefore, we have people celebrating this Christmas season that don't know what they're celebrating. I'm sorry, they just don't know what Christmas is about, what the celebration is about. It goes beyond something deeper than just joy. It goes some, some deeper than fruitcake. And, no, and nobody say nobody likes fruitcake. I like fruitcake. Nobody say I am a fruitcake either. Okay, I got a, I got a friend, okay? All right? 
So it goes deeper. We're not just simple merrymakers. If you want to be just a merrymaker, well then, I'm sorry. But we go deeper than that as Christians. We are children of the one who conquered death. He ushered in forgiveness. He gave us a unlimited eternal life that will never end with joy, but complete peace. But if we ignore John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, we miss it completely. Christmas is not about what you get under the tree or in the stocking. It's about the reason why we have the tree. Presley asked me at the beginning of the Christmas season a very, very profound question for an eight-year-old girl. She asked me, Dad, she said, the star, I know the wise men followed the star, that's why we have the star on top of the tree. But why do we have the tree? An eight-year-old was asking me a profound question for her age. But we need to think about it. why is it a tree? Why do we have a tree? The tree is because it's made of wood. That's where wood comes from. And wood together is what made the cross. If you read the original manuscripts, it says that the cross was a tree, that Christ hung on the tree. It was a tree. The first Christmas tree bore our Savior as the original ornament of grace. You with me, church? This was all prophecy. This was all planned. This was all orchestrated for the very first Christmas celebration that started way back in Bethlehem for the coming of what happened that day on Calvary. Now that we understand this, now that we understand that we are called to be children of the awaited one, and we can only be children of the awaited one, if we have faith, we have to deal with what was said earlier. What is the difference between faith and religion? Because only through faith is Jesus Christ. Well, religion is what man's system is created. We take the concept of faith, and we create a system around it. We think that we're smarter than what we are as humans. And we create a system around what we want our faith to be. With our own rules added to the scriptures. And pretty soon we come up with creeds. And we come up with different places where we have to worship. And with different places where people need to come if they want to know the truth. Instead of just being us being able to share the truth in a supermarket or a coffee shop. Religion is made by man. Faith is a universal, natural force that is created by God and only God. And the book of Romans tells us explicitly that to each person, God gave their own measure of faith. Everyone has faith, just not everyone uses faith well. Just like not everybody uses gravity well. When I was five years old, I didn't use gravity well. I had a cape tied around my neck, and I didn't think I was going to fall off the couch that day, but I did. I thought I was going to fly. Okay, but the what pulled me down? The law of gravity. So just like gravity is a natural force, so is faith. There are laws in place in order to use it, and if you don't use the laws of faith, you're going to get hurt, just like when you ignore the laws of gravity. What is the law of faith? It's centered around the sun, like an orbit. The son of God. Just as everything in our universe orbits around the sun of the universe, everything spiritually orbits around the sun of the universe. We are children of of a most high God for those of us that have faith in Him. It is a privilege. It is a right that He gives you for who those of you that latch on to the gospel. It's an eternal promise, and as we've discussed in our understanding of prophecy, He keeps promises, all promises. 
And what that means for us is that we're called to be like Him. If you are a child, you're going to reflect your parents. This is a thought that has haunted all of our thoughts one way or another. That moment where you hit your head and you think, oh my gosh, I'm my parent. I never wanted that to happen, but I'm my parents. We've all been there. We've all been there. But just as that's the truth here, we need to be in the truth in our hearts and our spirits. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4-5, through 5, it says, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Now what is Paul talking about here to the church in Thessalonica? He is talking about you need to not be as those who are lost, those in the dark. But you need to be like your father as children of the daylight. Why? Because you're not going to know when he's coming back for you. You need to be prepared. He did not give you a date to say, okay, I'm going to get spruced up for. I got company coming over. It's the son of God. He's returning on May 2nd, 2050 something. We don't have that. It's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to sneak up on us. Why? Because he wants us to be occupied with one thing and one thing only. Reflecting his light now. Amen. This Christmas, as we care with our families, as we have our decorated homes and have our abundance of fruitcake and eggnog and hot chocolate and merriment, we need to remember the profound truth. We are not just celebrating the act of a baby in a manger. No. We are celebrating a gift of eternal life. Proven by prophecy. Proven by promise. Proven by the word that claimed it first in our lives. The word of God that has stood the test of time. And we believe in the identity of our Lord as He has given us the identity as His children. We are no longer in waiting. We are in service. We are not the ones in waiting. The people who are lost are the ones in waiting. You have already received Christ if you've put your faith in Him. 